Thank you, uh, Najib, for the invitation to come here. It's my honor to, uh, to talk about uh, what we're doing. Um, so the, the, I'm interested on in human-centric problems. Um, and uh, I have a very active groups that have been working on very interesting problems where we, we, our goal is to uh, recognize, um, synthesize and modeling uh, behaviors from a computational perspective. Uh, and this has been powered for several of our uh, sponsor agencies that have believed in our in our research. Um, this sort of are the main areas in our lab. Um, we work on uh, affective computing. We try to understand how how we produce emotions and try to use those to recognize. Uh, we have been also working on the area of synthesis on how you take, for example, data driven modes to synthesize uh, behaviors like head movement, lip movements, gestures. Um, uh, in in a in the context of in vehicle systems, we're looking at multimodal systems that are able to recognize, for example, cognitive distraction, visual distractions. Uh, but as soon as you add one moda two, two modalities, there's a lot of challenges that ar arise that leads to uh, interesting theoretical problems on how you solve uh, a, and um, in the context of multimodal machine learning. And that's exactly what, what I would like to talk to you today um, and, and focus my my presentations is, is how how you build systems that can can be robust. For example, when you have missing modalities, when you have um, noise in your data, or when when can you make it more robust when leveraging unlabeled data? So the the reason reason why this area is very important is because as we communicate and we talk to to others, um, multimodal is the natural way we interact. We use gestures, right? We, we speak, we, we change our facial expressions. And that information, when you combine, can not only right, make uh, your system better, but also more robust. And it's been uh, used uh, with many um, applications in different domains uh, that has, uh, due to, to the, the powerful um, alternatives that offer dealing with multimodal data. Uh, this was not always the case. So when I started working on these problems, uh, the the main the state of the art approaches were based on hidden Markov models. There were very variants of 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 these systems, um, and all of them have in common right that you will do in Viterbi decodings. Um, if you if you know about this, you know that the the decoding is n squared t when n is the number of states. The problem with this um, with these models is that when you add uh, different modalities. The often solution was to compose the states. So if you have uh, n one state in one modality and two and two uh, states in the other modality, when the total number of uh, states that you would have is the product of them, which make this uh, computation very very slow. Uh, so as a result, it only work in very limited domains, or you have to make assumptions, right, that uh, uh, that make your system less appealing. Things have changed. So if you uh, Google uh, the, the the word multimodal or multimodal, you will find that over the the years, right, that uh, the uh, the interest in this area has ex exponentially increased, um, and that includes uh, work done on speech, vision, text, uh, and other physiological data as well. Um, the contributing factor for this is now we have a lot of data, right, which make this prof uh, make you you can uh, obtain data in an easy way by um, leveraging different social medias and so on. Um, also, we have advanced advances all the way from cloud source uh, cloud source uh, processing um, to to GPUs. Uh, we have infrastructures that we before we didn't have, so make that make pro, uh, problems that before it was not possible to address very now realistically feasible. Um, also, we start talking to each other, right? People in different communities start working together, and now. For example, to to, to design uh, people that look like uh, famous people that speak like famous people, but they're not. It's, it's just generated data. Um, we, for example, all the problems that we have to uh, solve or work on this area is giving us uh, an image, right? Trying to uh, get a, a caption. By the way, that's my dog, uh, my, my little dog. Uh, or the inverse problem, right? Giving a caption, right, or or a query, right? Get an image. So all these problems have been um, we, we, uh, ex successes in this area have shown right the, the powerful uh, potential of multimodal processing. Still, 
most of these areas consider images and um, text or a speech. And, and when, when you, you, you extend these models into videos or sequence of videos, right, there's an important aspect that needs to be addressed for this technology to, to be powerful. Um, what do you do when you have missing modalities? What do you do when you have uh, noisy modalities? Not all the, 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 some of the modalities are, are less reliable. Um, what do you do when you have partial information in, in, in your training or in your inference, when you try to inf do inference? How you deal with temporal models and labeled data? How you it, it deals with, with cases where you don't have two modalities, but you have, let's say, many, right? How, how you prioritize and give um, uh, the, the weight to those modalities accordingly? And of course, synchronizations of the modalities. In our lab, um, what I'm going to, to talk today is, is about uh, some of these challenges, right? The, the, the one on missing modalities, how you deal with noisy or less discriminative features, and uh, how you uh, alternative ways of, of doing unlabeled data, uh, leveraging models uh, for that. And we're going to focus most on a speech and face. So technically, it's a bi model, but um, so th this is what I'm going to, to be uh, describing. So let, let me start uh, by uh, showing examples of models that we have built to increase robustness. Again, we're going to start with missing modalities. The first example is, is the, what we call it the outformer. Um, uh, we, we use transformers and auxiliary tasks. Uh, the, the motivation for this, we were going to apply it to in the context of um, uh, emotional recognitions. Um, and these models you often assume that you have perfect data. You have a speech, you have face, and then you process. In reality, right, sometimes I'm listening, so I'm not speak speaking. Sometimes there's noise that prevents the audio to be used. Sometimes I'm not looking fr front uh, to the camera, so my, my information is uh, partial. So how you deal with these, these cases? And the, the solution that we came up with is, is displayed in this big diagram. Don't worry, I'm going to explain it very roughly, right? Let me go. I'm going to go into more detail than this, but it has sort of a future attention. This is where all the magic happens, where information is diffused between the two modalities. Uh, we have um, self-attention uh, layers with learnable scale parameters where we learn information across frames. Uh, and we also have um, a multi-layer uh, multi perceptor that, that do the classifications. And on the side, we have auxiliary networks that the only thing that they do is to process one of the modalities separately. One for the audio, other one from the video. So let's let's go into a bit more details, right? So over here, you you can see in the in this uh, on the plot on the on on this side, right? What is the aspect? What is the part of the model that we're talking about? Um, so what you see, um, the, the the first thing that we do here is uh, we because of the uh, we're going to use uh, multi head dot product attentions. We need the, the two modalities to have the same dimension. So we do projections. So for the audio, we use low level descriptors. We extract, let's say, fundamental frequency. We take uh, male frequency bands and a bunch of others. In total, it's 130 dimensional vectors. Uh, from the vision modality, we, we take, uh, we use an, a common embedding that, that has been used for face analysis, which is the VGG face model. And we fine tune it to emotions by using the affect net cor corpus. Uh, and then, so we, we project that data into the uh, 130 dimensional space. So they are, uh, at least they have the same dimension. They don't have to be synchronized. They do have to have the same dimensions. Um, and what we do there, we put the positional encodings to understand, to, to preserve the temporal information. And then uh, we combine the modalities and we do this with this multi, multi head dot product attentions. The key ask, this is with cross, uh, cross attentions. What, 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 what is, is interesting about this is that the, uh, query from one modality goes into the attention model of the other modality. So that, that helps to, to bring, um, th this is a very powerful way to combine the modalities. Um, so we, we, we do this process and then the next step is, is we have different frames. Not all the frames are equally important, right? So we, we, we introduce this idea of self-attention layers that, that, um, that have some, uh, uh, residual connections, so, and, and the, the, the parameters of these residual connections are learned. So we learn how, how much to trust on, on the data before and after being processed with the self-attention layers. Uh, and that information, right, is, is, is sent to, to the, um, uh, the perception model. Uh, the auxiliary network play a key role because our target here is to 
make a system that is robust even when you don't have full information. So what they do is they just focus on one modality, modality at a time. Um, so on the top, you have the auxiliarity, uh, auxiliarity audio network, and on the bottom, you have the auxiliarity visual modality. They're very similar to the multi-head multi uh, self-attentions, and, uh, and, and then we have the, the, the different classification losses. We, we classify based on the vision uh, features, we classify based on the acoustic features, and we classify when you have the combined information. So it's, it's a combination of these, these losses what make the, the, the system uh, very powerful. Uh, the, the other very important aspect of that we do is, is the way that you train this model, right? Because if you assume that all, all, all your training data is perfect, right, your model is not going to be as robust. So what we do is, is randomly we pick data um, and we replace it with zeros, right? Both on the acoustics and the, on the visual modalities. And we present this into batches. So some, some data is complete, some data is not. Um, our baselines, we take our model, we completely remove focus on the core part of this model and we remove the uh, auxiliary networks, right? So basically that that baseline will tell us how it works. Yes. Um, Good questions. Um, the I I believe that the, okay that the acoustic. I, I believe that, that that we 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 make sure that they they have the same frame. Um, or, or we do it with the. I I, I no I don't remember that they did. Yeah, either we sample them or um. Yeah, like yeah. So the. The second base, so again, this baseline, what it's going to tell us, right, is how um, how important are these auxiliary networks. The baseline number two and baseline number three uh, are models, state of the art models that that uh, basically use cross cross model attentions uh, or use transformer based approaches. Uh, the uh, for for um, processing multimodal information. So these these are two baselines that have been been used or, or two models, state of the art models that have been used. So. Uh, and force baseline that we use is just a uh, unimodal model, right? We use similar structure that, that we have for for auxiliary network, right? And and we uh, we use, we train only with one modality at a time. We tested this with two corpus, one is the MSP Impro, it was collected in our lab. Uh, these are a, a input, a improvisation scenario between two uh, individuals, and the. Uh, the, the classes are angry, happy, sad, and neutral. So it's a four class problem. The crema D was collected by the University of Penn, uh, Penn um, Pennsylvania, and it has 91 actors. Uh, the, it's a six class problem with angry, happy, sadness, fears, disgust, and neutral. So these are two corpus that uh, have been used in multiple processing. Um, and, and here's sort of the result. When you compare our model uh, with the baseline one, baseline one, remember, it's the same as our model without the auxiliary network. And we found that this adding the auxiliary network lead to significant improvements in performance. We see that both in both corpus. Um, the other things that uh, we observe in this graph is, is that baseline two and baseline three, which are, are all the still there are models that were uh, evaluated in, in the same settings that our, as our model, right, uh, have significantly lower performance than what we, we achieved, showing that the powerful uh, infrastructure uh, frameworks that, that, we, that, that we propose. So this, this graph, Yes. So uh, I'm guessing that the micro macro difference is basically rating each uh, yeah. equally. Yes. And when they're different, it means that some you're doing well and some you're not. Right. That's why the micro might be higher than that. Mm -hmm. So which are the emotions on MSP Pro that gives us the most problem? Neutral. Neutral is the one that gives the most problem. Okay. Because it's, 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 yeah, it's, Mm -hmm. It's sort of an, um, like uh, the, uh, usually like is show the lack of emotions and, and people are, are are in many cases right they they, they, dis they have more disagreement when you label that that, that emotional class that. And then also very quickly uh, the other baselines that you mentioned the two previous papers I don't know them can you say in just a sentence or two what those two are yes so this one was uh, uh the, the baseline number two is um. One that do transform, it, it was built with um, text, video, 
and audio, right? And what they do is they do sort of uh, cross cross modal attentions where we where they consider pair of emotions, pair of, of modalities. Excuse me. So you can see uh, visual to language, language to visual, and uh, language to acoustic. So th th those those are the three models. Now, because we are only using two modalities, right? We we adapt this model to just only incorporate visual and acoustic modality. And then they co co concatenate the information and then they, they classify. The baseline number three, what they do is um, just across modal attention, right, between the modalities. So they have the process, the audio from one side, video on the other side, and then they combine it using these cross modal attentions. So in that sense, I think that baseline two is a little bit like your own baseline one that you don't do any, uh, is it still missing? Well, it's, it only half, if I go back, it, it, it will be basically this, uh, oh, let me see. It, it will it will be mostly this part, right? Yeah. This part, right? We add this uh, okay. this part that also captures the temporal information. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So okay. So let me let me go over. Okay. So th this these uh, results are very interesting. Uh, let me let me show you this this figure, right? So what we do here is uh, blue. The bar blue is when you have. Uh, audiovisual information in your uh, on your testing set. Uh, orange is you only have visual information. There's no audio information, and, and the the green one is when you only have audio information. And here we compare uh, on for the two databases. We compare either regular training where you just uh, you train your model without um, removing or masking certain uh, some uh, some acoustic some samples. Or when you do it with this optimized training, where you randomly select twenty percent and you replace it with zeros, um, and what we the the interesting result uh, and result that we okay th this part that you see over there is the unimodal the baseline four right this is the when you only train in this case with unimodal with audio only and the touch or uh, orange line is when you only train uh, your model using visual modalities. So what we found uh, interesting in, in this case is that when you have uh, perfect information, uh, the optimized training does not affect the performance of your system. So this is a good thing, right? Because it might, it might affect the performance because you're removing certain features during training. But that's, that's, that's not, the, it's not the case, right? The results are very similar. Um, uh, the other thing that we, we found is that when you look at uh, the regular, regular training uh, the performance of the audio of the model, the audiovisual model tested only with audio, right, is much lower than the baseline that only use audio. However, when you do this optimized training, right, we, we get to that point, right? We get to about 60, 62, 6.62 to uh, per, uh, performance, okay? And with the same thing with the visual, right? If you don't do this optimized training, right, your performance is not as great, great as you can get if you do the the um, optimized training. And we see this performance also consistently with the MSP Impro, right? We, we get uh, very similar performance when you have all the information, but when you, you don't have the information with the optimized, you almost go, go to the level of what an, an unimodal system will do. Uh, this uh, So that, that is, is very promising. This, this also graph is, is interesting in the sense that what we do is we, we start masking the, the information, right? So what, what, what this is, that number of frames are available. So we start from 10% from one of the modalities, for example, um, the, the, the the one here on the, uh, this one, we are masking the audio, right? So that all the visual information is there, but the audio, we only start with 10% and we go all the way to 90%. And, and you can see this for the, the two databases. And what we found, again, this is the upper bound. This is when you, you don't mask any, you have all the information. Uh, this is unimodal system. So these are sort of the, the, the two important baseline that we have to compare all the models. And what we found is that our method, right, did to significant improvement, even when you only had 10% of the, 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 the modality that you're masking. And, and that uh, by when you have 90%, you have a big difference and we re reach almost the same performance that you would have achieved if you have full, full information. So yeah, that shows also, right, that, that we officially use the data to to build uh, to to predict the data. Um, so that that was one example that that we showed how you will deal with missing modalities. The second example I want to talk is uh, versatile audiovisual learning, and and the idea here, um, the what we want to add a handle right cases where either you have one modality or multiple modalities. We want a system that is flexible enough that doesn't really matter what the the, the modality you have. We want to uh, our model should be able to to use it. 
Uh, we want uh, a system that can easily be implemented as a regression model or as a classification problem. Uh, we will want to uh, also be able to train the model with partial informations um, or where, where uh, for example, we can use incomplete data for training or can even use unimodal database to train by, uh, the, the, our model. And the infrastructure that we, we designed was, uh, is also displayed here on, on, on the slide. So I'm going to go as, again, right, big picture of what this, uh, this, uh, this model has and then go into more details of explaining why the reasons why we add this into the model. First, we start with an encoder of the visual modality, and we have an encoder for the acoustic modalities. That, that information is going to a chair representation. That, so that, that process either the audio or the video information. And that uh, also, in parallel, we, we have these reconstruction blocks. What they do is, is, is try to reconstruct the input. Uh, so you can see it's sort of an encoder, the color uh, formulations at, at that level. And then we have the predictions that we have audiovisual predictions, right? Or, uh, unimodal predictions. So if you have, uh, have vision, you, you can predict it, uh, the emotions using the visual prediction. If you have acoustic, you can predict it with acoustic predictions and so on. So now let's let's go into a bit more details on, on this model. Now this the, the key part of this model is this idea of chair representation. Here we're I never I, we're not conca concatenating the information at this level. What we're doing is is passing the information either the acoustic modality or or the visual modality, but not never both. Okay. Um, so this sort serve like a switch, right? So when you have visual modalities, that information that goes into this chair representation. When you have acoustic modality, that's what it goes into 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 the uh, the chair representations. Um, the reconstruction loss. What what they try to do is is to capture the so what is important about the features embeddings, right? So through through by by trying to reconstruct the 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 data, we we get more discriminative features. And the, the, the way that we do this, we implement this with these residual connections that goes all the way from the visual encoders, right? Um, all the way, the, the residual connection that goes to the reconstruction layers. And we also use the, uh, these residual connections in our chair, chair representation. Um, so what, what, is, what is interesting with you have, let's say you have only audio, right? So let's say I use a, a unimodal data that only have audio, I can train that, that that part, all, all these, all the blocks that appears here as, uh, as green, I can train them right with this with audio only features, and and that information right all all this, I can I can train the audio uh, conformer right. Um, I can train the the predictions and the and the M MLP on on the top. When you have visual information, you can train that part of the blocks. Um, when you have both of them, or oh, and in either of these cases, right, you you are training also the chair representation. So when you either have audio or, or visual, when you have both of them, you train, you freeze the parameters of the chair representations. You get the representation from the, the acoustic, from the visual modalities, you combine them and you do predictions and you train the audiovisual prediction layers. So again, it's, it's a very different way of, of, if you think about, of combining the information. We're not concatenating, right? We're just passing through through some chair representations and, and um, and, and during inference, what we do is that let's say if you only have visual information, you provide the output of the visual feature, visual uh, visual blocks, right? Uh, if you if you only have acoustic, you only pass the predictions of the acoustic, of the acoustic block. But if you have both of them, right, you you th run through the audiovisual prediction layers. So it's very flexible in the sense, right? No matter what feature you have, right, the, the information can uh, the system can is able to to make the predictions. So the the losses, the way that we train it is is based on a classification loss, a gross entropy. If, if you're using, um, if, if it is a, a categorical emotion problem, like happy, angry, sad, or regression, if you're, you're looking at sort of attributes, for example, a row of valence and dominance. Um, and that you combine with the reconstruction losses. So that, that leads to, to the final losses that have either sort of the, the prediction layers and the, and the reconstruction layers. Um, baselines, we, we use, um, Again, models that have been proposed in the past, including our, our, our formers. This is the, the model that I just presented. Um, we use a, the unimodal system that have very similar structure to what we have. So it's five layers of, of conformer encoder layers, uh, followed by two fully connected layers. And we uh, uh, evaluate the models in the two same databases that I mentioned earlier, the MSP Impro. Uh, in this case, we're going to use uh, a row of values and dominance as our prediction because we want to show that this also works for regression problem. And in the Crema D, we're going to use uh, emotional categories, right? This, uh, these are the six emotions that, that I mentioned earlier. 
So uh, we're going to uh, run this five times, take the average. We, we're going to split the databases into 70, 15, and 15 percent, right, for training, development, and testing set that we know a speaker overlap. So there's no data that belong to the same speaker in, in each of these partitions. And and, and let, let's go to, to the results, right? This again shows the, the approaches that uh, the, the baseline models, including the, the um, audio only uh, unimodal systems at the bottom. Uh, when you look at the uh, when you look at the audiovisual part, right, which is this part of the table, you can see that our model leads to uh, much better performance than any other alternative approach. Um, when you look at uh, models that only use acoustic features, uh, you can see that um, uh, we lead to very competitive perform performance for, for in the case of um, uh, attributes, uh, we, we, we do not get better performance than the unimodal model for valence and dominance. However, when you look at the visual modalities, we do much better than any uh, the unimodal model. Uh, when you look at the performance that you achieve on the uh, categorical emotion uh, problems, we we see consistently uh, that our models are are lead to the best performance. Again, you you can compare that with other approaches, right? And and you will this this again we, we lead to uh, better performance. Um, when you have audiovisual information clearly, right? But also when you have all the acoustic information, we, we have a better performance. And, and when we have, uh, you, you test it only with the vision modalities, you also lead, lead to better performance. Okay, so this shows, again, two, two approaches that had, can be used to, to deal with um, missing modalities. Now, the, the other question, question that we have is, what do we do when uh, some of the data is noisy? Okay, so, some of the, the modalities are less reliable than, than others. How, how can you learn on the fly, right, which modality to trust? Um, and we're going to demonstrate this in the context of audiovisual speech, uh, audiovisual speech recognitions using uh, gating neural networks. So let me let me give you the motivation for this, right? Again, we, 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 in, in speech processing, uh, speech-based solutions have been very popular nowadays because it offers a human-free, um, uh, hands-free, excuse me, way of interacting with the system. Uh, we don't have to type. We just talk to the system. The system respond and and, and do the, the process. So a typical a typical system for a speech based device is start with a voice activity detections, and when you detect speech, it goes to different modules. Right? What we're going to look is uh, ASR. Um, the the issue with with uh, a, a well, when you put that ASR system working in real in real spaces, still we have issues with noise. Um, sometimes you you have um, uh, different speech mode, for example, sometimes we, we might whisper, so the visual information might be more, uh, provide extra information. So adding visual information in this context leads to uh, usually robustness uh, into to the speech processing uh, pipeline. Now, one common problem that we see when we use audiovisual speech, uh, rec uh, speech recognitions is that when you concatenate acoustic from the, the acoustic information, the visual information, um, the performance uh, do great when you have noise data, so you can demonstrate the, the, uh, the system's uh, improvement in performance on the case when you have noise, but when you test it on clean speech, the performance usually drops, okay? And the reason is it's very hard to do ASR with lips movement only. So the performance usually are very bad, right? But it, they, they do help, right? But when all the conditions are clean, Using audio for the most part is, is is a better better solution. So this in this example I, I have um, a model that was presented in in 2011 where where you have sort of an autoencoder multiple autoencoder where you have acoustic representation visual information and you try to reconstruct that and, and then you use the the chair representation for for the task and they show that they drop like almost six percent from the the multimodal system dropped six percent compared to the audio only solutions right. So again this is something that we really don't want right. We would like a system that under clean conditions work at least as good as uh, now the only solutions. And a system that um, when you add these information and you, and you have noise, right, lead to improvements. So that's basically, we, we want to add this information in a way that does not affect the performance. So a disclaimer here, this was done a, a couple of years ago when we were using still HMMs, so you, will be, you will see some HMMs uh, uh, formulations here. Um, so the way that we wanted to, to formulate the problem is sort of this idea of sort of a filter, right? That using the gating neural network to filter some of the information that, that we don't want. So uh, in a, a 
the regular uh, fully connected layers, right? You have um, uh, functions that multiply your input with these weights, and then you put some bias. Uh, what we like to do is multiply this, uh, the first part, right? We were highlighted here in red with this function f, which is a sigmoid, right? Which is either good one or zero. And what it, it does is it works like a switch. So if, if the information is noisy, right? I'm going to, if, if everything is good, I'm going to let every, every, everything propagate to the network. But we, we, we some of the modalities are, are considered noisy, right? We turn off that node, right? And um, worst case scenario, right? With the, all the information, all the vision information is in the script, script games that everything is bad from the visual modality. We would like our system to completely stop that, that to, from propagating to the system. So uh, the way that this is implemented, we add this getting layer into our audiovisual features. Uh, we, 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 we implemented this with um, element-wise multiplication. So let me go into, uh, into the, the implementation, how we did this. So this is sort of a regular uh, ways that you, you will build each of the, your node in the, your deep learning where you have the gradients, the common gradients and, and, and the function, right? The activation function, the input for that, right? And what we're going to do here is to uh, replace WX uh, in that equation, right? With this gating mechanism where, where w, the, the weight of the gating and, and the bias of the gating mechanisms right, are learned from, from the data. So that, that's what is cool. So you learn from the data, right? How to uh, let it go, uh, the, the information. So, so it propagates to the network or you stop it. Um, we test this, uh, uh, these ideas on the uh, uh, corpus that we collected at UT Dallas and in a, in a sound, sound boost. Uh, this uh, we use is 442 participants uh, with gender balance. Uh, in this project, we were interested on, on accent. So we will have uh, people from uh, American accent, Australian accent, Indian accent, Hispanic accent. And uh, for, for this particular project, since we are not interested in accent, we just focus on the uh, American speaker. Um, and we collected one of the be beauty things about this, this corpus that we use multiple uh, uh, sensors to record audio and vision um, or, or, and, and image, images. Uh, for the audio, right, we use a closed talk mics, excuse me, uh, a closed talk mics, a, a desktop mic that is in, uh, was on the table. Uh, we have a cell phone that was placed uh, about two meters from there and a tablet also about two meters from, from our subject. Um, so for this, we use two mics. We use the, a closed talk microphone and a tablet. The, the video was collected with a, a high definition camera and a tablet. So again, we, we use these informations uh, for, uh, for our purpose. I will tell you the configuration, the way that we do. So the content of this corpus is, uh, has read speech where we ask to read uh, continuous sentences, ask questions, uh, short phrases of commands, continuous speech. Uh, we also use spontaneous speech where we ask them to, to uh, spontaneously uh, complete certain tasks. On the, we did, all of this was in, with clean audio, right? Very controlled scenario. But we also ask them to, to repeat some of the tasks where we play some of our random noise uh, for a mall, home, offices, and restaurants. Uh, so we play that back into the, the, the sound booths, right? So we, now we have a connection of noise plus the, the, the audio that they're, they're doing. Um, we, we consider two conditions. One sort of, we call it the ideal conditions where we, we took the, the close talk mic and the high definition camera. So that, that's what we uh, highlight here in, in this quadrant. And, and we also look at a more challenging task where we use all the information coming from a tablet, which again was about two meters from the, from the subject. Um, so the first, the first step that we did before even going into the real data, right? We, let's, say, let's, say, let's come out with the, the, the most extreme cases. Let's replace visual information by noise. So we definitely write the second modality is not correlated at all with, with the audio or with the, with, with the lexical content or the, the transcriptions that we want to recognize. Uh, and the question was, can the, this G, uh, gating mechanism right, be useful to, to, um, to, to filter out and remove that information from the network? Um, and what we found here, again, two, two of the baseline that we have is, is, is a GMN HMN framework and a DNN HMN framework. The, the DNN is similar to our method, but without the gating mechanism. And what we find here is that our method, right, leads to performance that's almost equal, right? Okay, first of all, let me say that this is only audio. Okay, so there's no noise in that column, right? And here where you got in the audio with, with uh, the, the random uh, input. And what we found here is that our model, right, even though that doesn't get all the way to 4.0, which was our uh, best performance, um, 
if with the gating mechanism, right, it, it, it gets very close. And you can, if you compare that with other methods, right, that don't take in consideration that, you see that this noise information definitely affects the performance going to all the way to 13 uh, word error rate or 11 word error rate, uh, respectively, for the two baseline. Uh, the other thing that we did is, is look at, visualize the, act, the, the, the value of, of the activations in the nodes uh, on after after going through through the the getting mechanism that what we found again darker colors here means that information propagate while uh, uh, lighter colors means that the, the, the propagation stop and you clearly see that on uh, on this side um on, on all this side right is the noise data right on this side is the acoustic data so the model is definitely paying attention to the acoustic information so this gave us uh some some um we confirmed that this approach was working in the way that we wanted. So then we went into to perform uh, our evaluations in in the in our corpus. And what we found again, just to to, to we we have the models here. We 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 got the model only trained with audio, only trained with vision informations, and only and then trained with audio vision informations. Um, and then on the columns you have the ideal conditions, right? This is this is when you you use the close talk mics and the the close to mics and a high resolution cameras, you have the clean audio and noisy audio. And then you have the tablet conditions. This is sort of the most challenging condition because again, the, 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 the sensors were about a bit farther from, from it. What we found here, um, what we found here is, is you compare the audio only information, the, the best performance that we achieved, which 3.7, right? And you compare that with the performance that we obtained using our audio vision solutions, using the gating mechanisms, right? We basically match the performance. So a model does not drop performance uh, because in the clean conditions. So that was one of our goals, right? So we achieved that goal in the, with this framework. Um, and when you look at the most con most challenging conditions where you have noise and you have uh, the tablet conditions with, with the sensors, we found that our model leads to the best performance compared to the other two baseline. And when you compare the audio only, right, in these noisy conditions, and you compare that with what we get, is is, is we go from 33 worry rates to 11 worry rates. 11.5 word error rate. So again, that leads to uh, improvements in performance by, by, by using this uh, strategy. Uh, and what I want to highlight here, this is what I mentioned earlier, right? Visual information is not the great, is, is not the greatest feature for uh, for ASR. Um, so you see, we get very high word error, uh, word error rate, but even though the, the performance by itself with visual information is not great, when you combine that with the audio, um, in this challenging condition lead to very remarkable performance, right? So you 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 will go again uh, from 33% of error rate all the way to 11, right? By by using um, visual information. So it, it by itself is not great, but it, it can definitely improve your, your method. Um, again, here, if you compare just audio only versus audio, audio visual, right? The performance uh, are much better um, in all cases. The last, uh, the last uh, uh, topic that I want to discuss here is now in the presence of so much data, right? How you, do you uh, build or how you uh, leverage uh, this uh, um, massive amount of data to build systems that are more robust? And what I want to talk is particularly the case of a multimodal ladder network that we proposed not, not too long ago that I feel that uh, leads to in, in a direction that, uh, that can be uh, uh, quite quite useful opening research opportunities in this area. Um, so we have a, a limit, almost a limited amount of data. Uh, labeling the data is extensive, so we don't want to do that. We want to build supervised or semi-supervised models that that can do that. Uh, and our goal is to leverage relationships that go beyond addition or concatenations of features. We want to build systems that really. Take into take take advantage right of using different modalities, and we're going to use these applications. We're going to build this model right in the context of audio visual emotion recognition. Where where our goal is is the idea to capture not just um, to preserve not all, only cross modal information between the modalities, but also want to to capture modality specific information that is contained in each of our modalities. Um, the approach. Is based on the ladder network. So let, let me tell you first of all what, what is a ladder network, and then we're going to show you how we extend this into a multimodal framework. The ladder network, if you're not familiar with it, it has an encoder, um, an encoder, uh, and then you have a decoder. You, what what you do with the encoder is you add noise, 
to, to the encoder. So, so basically, you some of the task is to try to reconstruct the clean versions of the encoder. And for that, we copy a version of the cleanest code encoder to have that as our, our reference before we add the noise. Um, and then we use this chair representation to do our predictions. Now, what, what is interesting about this, this model is have these lateral connections, right, that help on the reconstruction part of you. So the, you don't want to also only go to the chair representation, but you also want to, to use intermediate representation to reconstruct the, the layers, the, the corresponding layers. Um, and the loss function that we're going to use for this is based on the, uh, the classification task, which is represented here by CC. And the, the this is, excuse, excuse me, the classification task and the reconstruction class uh, loss, which is represented by uh, CD over there in this formula. Now, one of the beauty about this model is that if you, let's say you have unlabeled data, you only, you don't have any label, you still can use it. You, you can still use this uh, but put it through the systems and only looking at the loss of the reconstruction loss. When you do have label, right? Let's say if you have, uh, you, you, you do have um, a label data, you can do both, right? You can do the reconstruction loss and also the classification loss at the same time. So this is those, so again, the, the, the framework that we propose for our multimodal network. Uh, again, it has different parts. Let me go quickly on, on that. We have, uh, uh, unimodal networks, right? So if you if you look, um, you have this is this is where one modality is going to be encoded. This is what the other modality is going to be encoded. You notice that they they propagate without going into this fusion part. Um, same thing here, okay. And then you have sort of a cross a cr um, cross attention layer, right? Similar to what we we were doing before. Um, so that that's the first part. Then then it goes through a, a process by one D convolution neural network. Uh, to, uh, to capture time, uh, temporary information. That, then it goes into um, uh, audiovisual uh, network, which I'm going to talk in a second, right? But the key part of that is this block on the top where we do cross border skip connections. Again, I'm going to, to go into the detail in, in, in these two blocks that I, I, I described. So let's start on the top. So again, we are we're looking here at uh, this part of the model. The idea here is that you're going to extract features, the unimodal features that come from this, from, from processing either the visual information or the acoustic information. And what we're going to do, we're going to try to reconstruct the intermediate representation by, by looking at the other modality. So we will try to reconstruct, for example, the acoustic modality with the, the representation that we get from the, the visual modalities and vice versa. That's why, for example, this, this block here with, with miscolor represent. So that's what we're trying to do. Uh, here on uh, at that level. Um, so again, we, we process here uh, unimodal modalities that goes into the process, and and then we try to reconstruct them right by by looking at the the other modality. Uh, again, the goal here is to again try to capture the relationship. Right? Can you predict visual embeddings from audio? Can you produce? predict audio modalities from video, right? And by doing so, right, you will be capturing uh, strong co connections between the modalities. The block in the middle, right, uh, that on, on the block is just a ladder network, very simple ladder network where, where that uh, takes into consideration, right, the information that is already fused for the audiovisual modality and, the, and, and uh, from, 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 from that uh, cross-modal attentions. And uh, so it has very, it, this is very similar to, to a, a simple ladder network. Right? There's nothing special about, the, the only thing is that the, the input of these modalities, right, are already, right, the, um, the, the, the process data that after the cross attention model. And, and then the predictions is going to be a combination of three, three losses. One that the audio, the audio uh, prediction, the video predictions, again, after these cross, cross skip connections. Um, and then the audiovisual connections that is, is, is coming out of the audiovisual networks. So we combine them. Um, so you have, um, in, in the, this setups where we're going to use the CREMA-D as our, our uh, target database for, to, to evaluate the performance, similar splitting as we did before, uh, no speaker, uh, no, no uh, overlap between the speakers. So let, let's take a look at the, the baseline. Again, we, we use the outformer that I presented early, right? That's one of our baseline. We use uh, these two models that, that we described early. So I, I just put it here as a reference, uh, but but, the, but uh, systems that have been used uh, uh, for, for multimodal processing. And, and let's take a look at the, the results. Um, so the first 
things that we notice here is that our model right is by far the best model across board right when you look at this is like a, in the crema this is a six six uh, class pro classification problem so you see that uh the performance is, is much better than, than the other baseline uh baseline one which has the cross attention so it has a flavor that's similar to what we're doing right but without the ladder network and it, it shows that our model right by, by adding this yeah, ladder network and reconstruction tasks through the ladder network right lead to better performance, uh, significant improvements, uh, and again much better than baseline two and three, the, the other two approaches that we that we tested. So in this study, right, we did an ablation study. So we, if this is again our full model, uh, what we do do first, right, uh, is we remove the cross model attention. So this part of the model we just get rid of that one, and and you can see the result here on. On ablation one, you see that the when you compare this the, this model with the full model, right, the performance definitely dropped like two or three percent uh, compared compared to to this uh, the full case. Um, and when we remove the the one in the middle, uh, the, the multimodal layer network, right, that combine the, the the representation from from the cross uh, cross model attentions, you see that the performance again also right dropped significantly compared to the the approach of uh, achieved by our model. So again, showing again the, the robustness of the approach. So that's uh, that, that's uh, the the examples I want to show, right? Like, um, if, so to conclude, what's next, right? What what, what are things that are exciting, uh, in at least for me, right? So, um, I think we are just uh, just starting to see what you can do with unlabeled data, um, if, even when you don't have labels. So this is just the beginning. I, I believe that we can have self-supervised multimodal representations that are going to be super powerful. Um, um, you, could, you can use this super self-supervised representation even if your task is unimodal. So you can use a multimodal model, right, that when tested on a, uh, a sing single task or, or unimodal task, right, can lead to, to improvements. Um, also, so far I've been dealing with two modalities. Of course, text is the next one, right? Like it's, it's, it's clearly that, that that can introduce uh, complementary information. Um, however, what do you do when you have more, right? Like how you now reliably say, okay, if, uh, which modalities to to trust, right? And make the system such that it does not exponentially increase. If you see all all the models, right, have sort of connection between audio and vision, right? But now, now assume, think about a case where you have ten modalities, right? At some point, you cannot have all kind of combination, but be, uh, per, um, uh, pairwise uh, combinations of this model because the model is going to explode exponentially, right? So how you can uh, build these models, right, as your modality numbers increases. Um, and how you explain the, the relationship better between the modalities. Again, these all things are, are very important. And again, for me also, what is very cool is how you use this technology, right, in a deployable systems that can, can serve in different areas, right? Like security, uh, all the way to uh, healthcare, uh, how how you use this the system to make, for example, personal 